presence, which is to say before you are fully conscious. You shift back and forth for a while between consciousness and unconsciousness, between the state of presence and the state of mind identification. You lose the now, and you return to it again and again. Eventually, presence becomes your predominant state. For most people, presence is experienced either never at all or only accidentally, and briefly on rare occasions, without being recognized for what it is. Most humans alternate not between consciousness and unconsciousness, but only between different levels of unconsciousness. Ordinary unconsciousness and deep unconsciousness. What do you mean by different levels of unconsciousness? As you probably know, in sleep, you constantly move between the phases of dreamless sleep and the dream state. Similarly, in wakefulness most people only shift between ordinary unconsciousness and deep unconsciousness. What I call ordinary unconsciousness means being identified with your thought processes and emotions, your reactions, desires, and aversions. It is most people's normal state. In that state, you are run by the egoic mind, and you are unaware of being. It is a state not of acute pain or unhappiness, but of an almost continuous low level of unease, discontent, boredom, or nervousness a kind of background static. You may not realize this because it is so much a part of normal living, just as you are not aware of a continuous low background noise such as the hum of an air conditioner, until it stops. When it suddenly does stop, there is a sense of relief. Many people use alcohol, drugs, sex, food, work, television, or even shopping as anesthetics in an unconscious attempt to remove the basic unease. When this happens, an activity that might be very enjoyable if used in moderation becomes imbued with a compulsive or addictive quality and all that is ever achieved through it is extremely short-lived symptom relief. The unease of ordinary unconsciousness turns into the pain of deep unconsciousness, a state of more acute and more obvious suffering or unhappiness, when things go wrong, when the ego is threatened, or there is a major challenge, threat, or loss real or imagined, in your life situation or conflict in a relationship. It is an intensified version of ordinary unconsciousness, different from it not in kind, but in degree. In ordinary unconsciousness, habitual resistance to or denial of what is creates the unease and discontent that most people accept as normal living. When this resistance becomes intensified through some challenge or threat to the ego, it brings up intense negativity such as anger, acute fear, aggression, depression, and so on. Deep unconsciousness often means that the pain body has been triggered and that you have become identified with it. Physical violence would be impossible without deep unconsciousness. It can also occur easily whenever and wherever a crowd of people or even an entire nation generates a negative collective energy field. The best indicator of your level of consciousness is how you deal with life's challenges when they come. Through those challenges, an already unconscious person tends to become more deeply unconscious, and a conscious person more intensely conscious. You can use a challenge to awaken you, or you can allow it to pull you into even deeper sleep. The dream of ordinary unconsciousness then turns into a nightmare. If you cannot be present even in normal circumstances, such as when you are sitting alone in a room, walking in the woods, or listening to someone, and you certainly won't be able to stay conscious when something goes wrong, or you are faced with difficult people or situations, with loss or the threat of loss, you will be taken over by a reaction, which ultimately is always some form of fear, and pulled into deep unconsciousness. Those challenges are your tests. Only the way in which you deal with them will show you and others, where you are at as far as your state of consciousness is concerned, not how long you can sit with your eyes closed or what visions you see. So it is essential to bring more consciousness into your life in ordinary situations, when everything is going relatively smoothly. In this way, you grow in presence power. It generates an energy field in you and around you of a high vibrational frequency. No unconsciousness, no negativity, no discord or violence can enter that field and survive, just as darkness cannot survive in the presence of light. When you learn to be the witness of your thoughts and emotions, which is an essential part of being present, you may be surprised when you first become aware of the background static of ordinary unconsciousness and realize how rarely, 
If ever you are truly at ease within yourself on the level of your thinking, you will find a great deal of resistance in the form of judgment, discontent, and mental projection away from the now. On the emotional level, there will be an undercurrent of unease, tension, boredom, or nervousness. Both are aspects of the mind in its habitual resistance mode. What are they seeking? Carl Jung tells in one of his books of a conversation he had with a Native American chief, who pointed out to him that in his perception, most white people have tense faces, staring eyes, and a cruel demeanor. He said, they are always seeking something. What are they seeking? The whites always want something. They are always uneasy and restless. We don't know what they want. We think they are mad. The undercurrent of constant unease started long before the rise of Western industrial civilization, of course, but in Western civilization, which now covers almost the entire globe, including most of the East, it manifests in an unprecedentedly acute form. It was already there at the time of Jesus, and it was there six years before that at the time of Buddha, and long before that. Why are you always anxious? Jesus asked his disciples, Can anxious thought add a single day to your life? And the Buddha taught that the root of suffering is to be found in our constant wanting and craving. Resistance to the now as a collective dysfunction is intrinsically connected to loss of awareness of being, and forms the basis of our dehumanized industrial civilization. Freud, by the way, also recognized the existence of this undercurrent of unease and wrote about it in his book Civilization and Its Discontents. But he did not recognize the true root of the unease, and failed to realize that freedom from it is possible. This collective dysfunction has created a very unhappy and extraordinarily violent civilization that has become a threat not only to itself, but also to all life on the planet. Dissolving ordinary unconsciousness. So how can we be free of this affliction? Make it conscious. Observe the many ways in which unease, discontent, and tension arise within you through unnecessary judgment, resistance to what is, and denial of the now. Anything unconscious dissolves when you shine the light of consciousness on it. Once you know how to dissolve ordinary unconsciousness, the light of your presence will shine brightly, and it will be much easier to deal with deep unconsciousness whenever you feel its gravitational pull. However, ordinary unconsciousness may not be easy to detect initially, because it is so normal. Make it a habit to monitor your mental emotional state through self-observation. Am I at ease at this moment? Is a good question to ask yourself frequently. Or you can ask, what's going on inside me at this moment? Be at least as interested in what goes on inside you as what happens outside. If you get the inside right, the outside will fall into place. Primary reality is within, secondary reality without. But don't answer these questions immediately. Direct your attention inward. Have a look inside yourself. What kind of thoughts is your mind producing? What do you feel? Direct your attention into the body. Is there any tension? Once you detect that there is a low level of unease, the background static, see in what way you are avoiding, resisting, or denying life by denying the now. There are many ways in which people unconsciously resist the present moment. I will give you a few examples. With practice, your power of self-observation, of monitoring your inner state, will become sharpened. Freedom from unhappiness. Do you resent doing what you are doing? It may be your job, or you may have agreed to do something and are doing it, but part of you resents and resists it. Are you carrying unspoken resentment toward a person close to you? Do you realize that the energy you thus emanate is so harmful in its effects, that you are in fact contaminating yourself as well as those around you? Have a good look inside. Is there even the slightest trace of resentment, unwillingness? If there is, observe it on both the mental and the emotional levels. What thoughts is your mind creating around this situation? Then look at the emotion which is the body's reaction to those thoughts. Feel the emotion. Does it feel pleasant or unpleasant? Is it an energy that you would actually choose to have inside you? Do you have a choice? Maybe you are being taken advantage of. Maybe the activity you are engaged in is tedious. Maybe someone close to you is dishonest, irritating, or unconscious. But all this is irrelevant. Whether your thoughts and emotions about this situation are justified or not makes no difference. The fact is that you are resisting what is. You are making the present moment into an enemy. You are creating unhappiness, 
conflict between the inner and the outer, your unhappiness is polluting not only your own inner being and those around you, but also the collective human psyche, of which you are an inseparable part. The pollution of the planet is only an outward reflection of an inner psychic pollution. Millions of unconscious individuals not taking responsibility for their inner space. Either stop doing what you are doing, speak to the person concerned, and express fully what you feel. Or drop the negativity that your mind has created around the situation, and that serves no purpose whatsoever, except to strengthen a false sense of self. Recognizing its futility is important. Negativity is never the optimum way of dealing with any situation. In fact, in most cases it keeps you stuck in it, blocking real change. Anything that is done with negative energy will become contaminated by it and in time give rise to more pain, more unhappiness. Furthermore, any negative inner state is contagious. Unhappiness spreads more easily than a physical disease. Through the law of resonance, it triggers and feeds latent negativity in others, unless they are immune that is, highly conscious. How can we drop negativity, as you suggest? By dropping it, how do you drop a piece of hot coal that you are holding in your hand? How do you drop some heavy and useless baggage that you are carrying? By recognizing that you don't want to suffer the pain or carry the burden anymore, and then letting go of it. Deep unconsciousness, such as the pain body, or other deep pain, such as the loss of a loved one, usually needs to be transmuted through acceptance. Combined with the light of your presence, your sustained attention, Many patterns in ordinary unconsciousness, on the other hand, can simply be dropped once you know that you don't want them and don't need them anymore. Once you realize that you have a choice, that you are not just a bundle of conditioned reflexes. All this implies that you are able to access the power of now. Without it, you have no choice. If you call some emotions negative, aren't you creating a mental polarity of good and bad, as you explained earlier? No. The polarity was created at an earlier stage when your mind judged the present moment as bad. This judgment then created the negative emotion. But if you call some emotions negative, aren't you really saying that they shouldn't be there? That it's not okay to have those emotions? My understanding is that we should give ourselves permission to have whatever feelings come up, rather than judge them as bad or say that we shouldn't have them. It's okay to feel resentful. It's okay to be angry, irritated moody or whatever otherwise, we get into repression, inner conflict, or denial. Everything is okay as it is, of course. Once a mind pattern, an emotion or a reaction is there, accept it. You were not conscious enough to have a choice in the matter. That's not a judgment, just a fact. If you had a choice, or realized that you do have a choice, would you choose suffering or joy, ease or unease, peace or conflict? Would you choose a thought or feeling that cuts you off from your natural state of well-being, the joy of life within? Any such feeling I call negative, which simply means bad. Not in the sense that you shouldn't have done that, but just plain factual bad. Like feeling sick in the stomach. How is it possible that humans killed an excess of 100 million fellow humans in the 20th century? Alone for humans inflicting pain of such magnitude on one another is beyond anything you can imagine. And that's not taking into account the mental, emotional, and physical violence, the torture, pain, and cruelty they continue to inflict on each other, as well as on other sentient beings on a daily basis. Do they act in this way because they are in touch with their natural state, the joy of life within? Of course not. Only people who are in a deeply negative state, who feel very bad indeed, would create such a reality as a reflection of how they feel. Now they are engaged in destroying nature and the planet that sustains them. Unbelievable but true. Humans are a dangerously insane and very sick species. That's not a judgment. It's a fact. It is also a fact that the sanity is there underneath the madness. Healing and redemption are available right now. Coming back specifically to what you said it is certainly true that when you accept your resentment, moodiness, anger, and so on, you are no longer forced to act them out blindly, and you are less likely to project them onto others. But I wonder if you are not deceiving yourself. When you have been practicing acceptance for a while, as you have, there comes a point when you need to go on to the next stage, where those negative emotions are not created anymore. And if you really knew deeply that everything is okay, as you put it, 
and which of course is true. Then would you have those negative feelings in the first place? Without judgment, without resistance to what is, they would not arise. You have an idea in your mind that everything is okay, but deep down you don't really believe it. And so the old mental emotional patterns of resistance are still in place. That's what makes you feel bad. Are you defending your right to be unconscious? your right to suffer. Don't worry. Nobody is going to take that away from you. Once you realize that a certain kind of food makes you sick, would you carry on eating that food and keep asserting that it is okay to be sick? Wherever you are, be there totally. Can you give some more examples of ordinary unconsciousness? See if you can catch yourself complaining, in either speech or thought, about a situation you find yourself in. What other people do or say. Your surroundings your life situation, even the weather. To complain is always non-acceptance of what is. It invariably carries an unconscious negative charge. When you complain, you make yourself into a victim. When you speak out, you are in your power. Ordinary unconsciousness is always linked in some way with denial of the now. The now, of course, also implies the here. Are you resisting your here and now? Some people would always rather be somewhere else. Their here is never good enough. Through self-observation, find out if that is the case in your life. Wherever you are, be there totally. If you find your here and now intolerable and it makes you unhappy, you have three options. Remove yourself from the situation, change it, or accept it totally. If you want to take responsibility for your life, you must choose one of those three options and you must choose now. Then accept the consequences. No excuses. No negativity. No psychic pollution. Keep your inner space clear. If you take any action leaving or changing your situation, drop the negativity first, if at all possible. Action arising out of insight into what is required is more effective than action arising out of negativity. Any action is often better than no action. Especially if you have been stuck in an unhappy situation for a long time. Fear cannot prevail against it. Only a surrendered person has spiritual power. Through surrender, you will be free internally of the situation. You may then find that the situation changes without any effort on your part. In any case, you are free. Or is there something that you should be doing but are not doing it? Get up and do it now. Alternatively, completely accept your inactivity laziness, or passivity at this moment. If that is your choice, go into it fully. Enjoy it. Be as lazy or inactive as you can. If you go into it fully and consciously, you will soon come out of it. Or maybe you won't. Either way, there is no inner conflict, no resistance, no negativity. Are you stressed? Are you so busy getting to the future that the present is reduced to a means of getting there? Stress is caused by being here but wanting to be there, or being in the present, but wanting to be in the future. It's a split that tears you apart inside. To create and live with such an inner split is insane. The fact that everyone else is doing it doesn't make it any less insane. If you have to, you can move fast, work fast, or even run, without protecting yourself into the future and without resisting the present. As you move, work, run, do it totally. Enjoy the flow of energy, the high energy of that moment. Now you are no longer stressed, no longer splitting yourself in two. Just moving, running, working and enjoying it. Or you can drop the whole thing and sit on a park bench. But when you do, watch your mind. It may say, you should be working, you are wasting time. Observe the mind, smile at it. Does the past take up a great deal of your attention? Do you frequently talk and think about it, either positively or negatively? The great things that you have achieved, your adventures or experiences, or your victim story and the dreadful things that were done to you, or maybe what you did to someone else. Are your thought processes creating guilt, pride, resentment, anger, regret, or self-pity? Then you are not only reinforcing a false sense of self, but also helping to accelerate your body's aging process by creating an accumulation of past in your psyche. Verify this for yourself by observing those around you who have a strong tendency to hold on to the past. Die to the past every moment. You don't need it. Only refer to it when it is absolutely relevant to the present. Feel the power of this moment and the fullness of being. Feel your presence. Are you worried? Do you have many what-if thoughts? You are identified with your mind. 
which is projecting itself into an imaginary future situation and creating fear. There is no way that you can cope with such a situation, because it doesn't exist. It's a mental phantom. You can stop this health and life corroding insanity simply by acknowledging the present moment. Become aware of your breathing. Feel the air flowing in and out of your body. Feel your inner energy field. All that you ever have to deal with, cope with, in real life as opposed to imaginary mind projections is this moment. Ask yourself what problem you have right now, not next year, tomorrow, or five minutes from now. What is wrong with this moment? You can always cope with the now, but you can never cope with the future nor do you have to. The answer, the strength. The right action or the resource will be there when you need it, not before, not after. One day I'll make it. Is your goal taking up so much of your attention that you reduce the present moment to a means to an end? Is it taking the joy out of your doing? Are you waiting to start living? If you develop such a mind pattern, no matter what you achieve or get, the present will never be good enough, the future will always seem better. A perfect recipe for permanent dissatisfaction and non-fulfillment, don't you agree? Are you a habitual waiter? How much of your life do you spend waiting? What I call small-scale waiting is waiting in line at the post office, in a traffic jam, at the airport, or waiting for someone to arrive, to finish work, and so on. Large-scale waiting is waiting for the next vacation, for a better job, for the children to grow up, for a truly meaningful relationship. For success, to make money, to be important, to become enlightened. It is not uncommon for people to spend their whole life waiting to start living. Waiting is a state of mind. Basically, it means that you want the future. You don't want the present. You don't want what you've got. And you want what you haven't got. With every kind of waiting, you unconsciously create inner conflict between your here and now. Where you don't want to be. And the projected future. Where you want to be. This greatly reduces the quality of your life by making you lose the present. There is nothing wrong with striving to improve your life situation. You can improve your life situation, but you cannot improve your life. Life is primary. Life is your deepest inner being. It is already whole, complete, perfect. Your life situation consists of your circumstances and your experiences. There is nothing wrong with setting goals and striving to achieve things. The mistake lies in using it as a substitute for the feeling of life, for being. The only point of access for that is the now. You are then like an architect who pays no attention to the foundation of a building, but spends a lot of time working on the superstructure. For example, many people are waiting for prosperity. It cannot come in the future. When you honor, acknowledge, and fully accept your present reality where you are, who you are, what you are doing right now when you fully accept what you have got. You are grateful for what you have got, grateful for what is, grateful for being. If you are dissatisfied with what you have got, or even frustrated or angry about your present lack, that may motivate you to become rich. But even if you do make millions, you will continue to experience the inner condition of lack, and deep down you will continue to feel unfulfilled. You may have many exciting experiences that money can buy, but they will come and go and always leave you with an empty feeling and the need for further physical or psychological gratification. You won't abide in being and so feel the fullness of life now that alone is true prosperity. So give up waiting as a state of mind. When you catch yourself slipping into waiting, snap out of it. Come into the present moment. Just be and enjoy being. If you are present, there is never any need for you to wait for anything. So next time somebody says, sorry to have kept you waiting, you can reply, that's all right. I wasn't waiting. I was just standing here enjoying myself and joy in myself. These are just a few of the habitual mind strategies for denying the present moment that are part of ordinary unconsciousness. They are easy to overlook because they are so much a part of normal living. The background static of perpetual discontent. But the more you practice monitoring your inner mental emotional state, the easier it will be to know when you have been trapped in past or future which is to say unconscious, and to awaken out of the dream of time into the present. But beware, the false, unhappy self, based on mind identification, lives on time. It knows that the present moment is its own death, and so feels very threatened by it. It will do all it can to take you out of it. It will try to keep you trapped in time. The inner purpose of your life's journey. I can see the truth of what you are saying. 
But I still think that we must have purpose on our life's journey. Otherwise we just drift. And purpose means future, doesn't it? How do we reconcile that with living in the present? When you are on a journey, it is certainly helpful to know where you are going, or at least the general direction in which you are moving. But don't forget, the only thing that is ultimately real about your journey is the step that you are taking at this moment. That's all there ever is. Your life's journey has an outer purpose and an inner purpose. The outer purpose is to arrive at your goal or destination, to accomplish what you set out to do to achieve this or that, which, of course, implies future. It has nothing to do with future, but everything to do with the quality of your consciousness at this moment. The outer purpose belongs to the horizontal dimension of space and time. The inner purpose concerns a deepening of your being in the vertical dimension of the timeless now. Your outer journey may contain a million steps. Your inner journey only has one. The step you are taking right now. As you become more deeply aware of this one step, you realize that it already contains within itself all the other steps as well as the destination. This one step then becomes transformed into an expression of perfection, an act of great beauty and quality. It will have taken you into being, and the light of being will shine through it. This is both the purpose and the fulfillment of your inner journey, the journey into yourself. Does it matter whether we achieve our outer purpose, whether we succeed or fail in the world, or the other way around, which is actually more common, outer riches and inner poverty, or to gain the world and lose your soul, as Jesus puts it. Ultimately, of course, every outer purpose is doomed to fail sooner or later simply because it is subject to the law of impermanence of all things. The sooner you realize that your outer purpose cannot give you lasting fulfillment, the better. The past cannot survive in your presence. You mentioned that thinking or talking about the past unnecessarily is one of the ways in which we avoid the present. But apart from the past that we remember and perhaps identify with, isn't there another level of past within us that is much more deep-seated? I am talking about the unconscious past that conditions our lives, especially through early childhood experiences, perhaps even past life experiences. And then there is our cultural conditioning, which has to do with where we live geographically, and the historical time period in which we live. All these things determine how we see the world, how we react, what we think, what kind of relationships we have how we live our lives. How could we ever become conscious of all that or get rid of it? Mo long would that raise? And even if we did, what would there be left? You may think that you need more time to understand the past or become free of it. In other words, that the future will eventually free you of the past. This is a delusion. Only the present can free you of the past. More time cannot free you of time. Access the power of now. That is the key. What is the power of now? None other than the power of your presence, your consciousness liberated from thought forms. So deal with the past on the level of the present. The more attention you give to the past, the more you energize it, and the more likely you are to make a self out of it. Don't misunderstand. Attention is essential, but not to the past as past. Give attention to the present. Give attention to your behavior to your reactions, moods, thoughts, emotions, fears, and desires as they occur in the present. There's the past in you. If you can be present enough to watch all those things, not critically or analytically but non-judgmentally, then you are dealing with the past and dissolving it through the power of your presence. Isn't it helpful to understand the past and so understand why we do certain things, react in certain ways, or why we unconsciously create our particular kind of drama? patterns and relationships, and so on. As you become more conscious of your present reality, you may suddenly get certain insights as to why your conditioning functions in those particular ways. For example, why your relationships follow certain patterns, and you may remember things that happened in the past or see them more clearly. That is fine and can be helpful, but it is not essential. What is essential is your conscious presence. That dissolves the past. That is the transformative agent. So don't seek to understand the past, but be as present as you can. The past cannot survive in your presence. It can only survive in your absence. Chapter 5. The State of Presence. It's not what you think it is. You keep talking about the state of presence as the key. I think I understand it intellectually. But I don't know if I have ever truly experienced it. I wonder is it what I think it is, 
Or is it something entirely different? It's not what you think it is. You can't think about presence, and the mind can't understand it. Understanding presence is being present. Try a little experiment. Close your eyes and say to yourself, I wonder what my next thought is going to be. Then become very alert and wait for the next thought. Be like a cat watching a mouse hole. What thought is going to come out of the mouse hole? Try it now. Well, I had to wait for quite a long time before a thought came in. Exactly. As long as you are in a state of intense presence, you are free of thought. You are still yet highly alert. The instant your conscious attention sinks below a certain level, thought rushes in. The mental noise returns. The stillness is lost. You are back in time to test their degree of presence. Some Zen masters have been known to creep up on their students from behind and suddenly hit them with a stick. Quite a shock. If the student had been fully present and in a state of alertness, if he had kept his loin girded and his lamp burning, which is one of the analogies that Jesus uses for presence, he would have noticed the master coming up from behind and stopped him or stepped aside. But if he were hit, that would mean he was immersed in thought, which is to say absent, unconscious. To stay present in everyday life, it helps to be deeply rooted within yourself. Otherwise, the mind, which has incredible momentum, will drag you along like a wild river. What do you mean by rooted within yourself? It means to inhabit your body fully, to always have some of your attention in the inner energy field of your body, to feel the body from within, so to speak. Body awareness keeps you present. It anchors you in the now. See chapter 6, the esoteric meaning of waiting. In a sense, the state of presence could be compared to waiting. Jesus used the analogy of waiting in some of his parables. This is not the usual border restless kind of waiting that is a denial of the present and that I spoke about already. It is not a waiting in which your attention is focused on some point in the future, and the present is perceived as an undesirable obstacle that prevents you from having what you want. There is a qualitatively different kind of waiting, one that requires your total alertness. Something could happen at any moment, and if you are not absolutely awake, absolutely still, you will miss it. This is the kind of waiting Jesus talks about. In that state, all your attention is in the now. There is none left for daydreaming, thinking, remembering, anticipating. There is no tension in it, no fear, just alert presence. You are present with your whole being, with every cell of your body. In that state, the you that has a past and a future, the personality if you like, is hardly there anymore. And yet nothing of value is lost. You are still essentially yourself. In fact, you are more fully yourself than you ever were before. Or rather, it is only now that you are truly yourself. Be like a servant waiting for the return of the master, says Jesus. The servant does not know at what hour the master is going to come. So he stays awake, alert, poised, still, lest he miss the master's arrival. Even the men who wrote the Gospels did not understand the meaning of these parables. So the first misinterpretations and distortions crept in as they were written down, with subsequent erroneous interpretations. The real meaning was completely lost. These are parables not about the end of the world, but about the end of psychological time. They point to the transcendence of the egoic mind, and the possibility of living in an entirely new state of consciousness. Beauty arises in the stillness of your presence. What you have just described is something that I occasionally experience for brief moments when I am alone and surrounded by nature. Yes, Zen masters use the word Satori to describe a flash of insight, a moment of no mind and total presence. Although Satori is not a lasting transformation, be grateful when it comes, for it gives you a taste of enlightenment. You may, indeed, have experienced it many times without knowing what it is and realizing its importance. Presence is needed to become aware of the beauty, the majesty, the sacredness of nature. Have you ever gazed up into the infinity of space on a clear night, awestruck by the absolute stillness and inconceivable vastness of it? Have you listened, truly listened? to the sound of a mountain stream in the forest, or to the song of a blackbird at dusk on a quiet summer evening. Beyond the beauty of the external forms, there is more here, something that cannot be named, something ineffable, some deep, inner, holy essence. Whenever and wherever there is beauty, 
This inner essence shines through somehow. It only reveals itself to you when you are present. Could it be that this nameless essence and your presence are one and the same? Would it be there without your presence? Go deeply into it. Find out for yourself. When you experienced those moments of presence, you likely didn't realize that you were briefly in a state of no mind. This is because the gap between that state and the influx of thought was too narrow. Your satori may only have lasted for a few seconds before the mind came in, but it was there. Otherwise, you would not have experienced the beauty. Mind can neither recognize nor create beauty, only for a few seconds, while you were completely present. Was that beauty or that sacredness there? Because of the narrowness of that gap and a lack of vigilance and alertness on your part, you were probably unable to see the fundamental difference between the perception, the thoughtless awareness of beauty, and the naming and interpreting of it as thought. The wider the time gap between perception and thought, the more depth there is to you as a human being, which is to say the more conscious you are. Many people are so imprisoned in their minds that the beauty of nature does not really exist for them. They might say, what a pretty flower, but that's just a mechanical mental labeling. Because they are not still, not present. They don't truly see the flower, don't feel its essence, its holiness just as they don't know themselves, don't feel their own essence, their own holiness. Because we live in such a mind-dominated culture, most modem art, architecture, music, and literature are devoid of beauty, of inner essence, with very few exceptions. The reason is that the people who create those things cannot even for a moment free themselves from their mind, so they are never in touch with that place within where true creativity and beauty arise. The mind left to itself creates monstrosities, and not only in art galleries. Look at our urban landscapes and industrial wastelands. No civilization has ever produced so much ugliness. Realizing pure consciousness is presence he same as being. When you become conscious of being, what is really happening is that being becomes conscious of itself. When being becomes conscious of itself, that's presence. Since being, consciousness, and life are synonymous, we could say that presence means consciousness becoming conscious of itself, or life attaining self-consciousness. But don't get attached to the words, and don't make an effort to understand this. There is nothing that you need to understand before you can become present. I do understand what you just said, but it seems to imply that being, the ultimate transcendental reality, is not yet complete that it is undergoing a process of development. Does God need time for personal growth? Yes, but only as seen from the limited perspective of the manifested universe. In the Bible, God declares, I am the Alpha and the Omega, and I am the Living One. In the timeless realm where God dwells, which is also your home, the beginning and the end, the Alpha and the Omega, are one, and the essence of everything that ever has been and ever will be is eternally present in an unmanifested state of oneness and perfection, totally beyond anything the human mind can ever imagine or comprehend. In our world of seemingly separate forms, however, timeless perfection is an inconceivable concept. Here even consciousness, which is the light emanating from the eternal source, seems to be subject to a process of development. That this is due to our limited perception. It is not so in absolute terms. Nevertheless, let me continue to speak for a moment about the evolution of consciousness in this world. Everything that exists has being, has got essence, has some degree of consciousness. Even a stone has rudimentary consciousness. Otherwise, it would not be, and its atoms and molecules would disperse. Everything is alive. The sun, the earth, plants, animals, humans all are expressions of consciousness in varying degrees. Consciousness manifesting as form. The world arises when consciousness takes on shapes and forms, thought forms and material forms. Look at the millions of life forms on this planet alone, in the sea, on land, in the air and then each life form is replicated millions of times. To what end? Is someone or something playing a game? A game with form? This is what the ancient seers of India asked themselves. They saw the world as Lila a kind of divine game that God is playing. The individual life forms are obviously not very important in this game. In the sea, most life forms don't survive for more than a few minutes after being born. The human form turns to dust pretty quickly too, and when it is gone, it is as if it had never been. Is that tragic or cruel? 
only if you create a separate identity for each form, if you forget that its consciousness is God essence expressing itself in form. But you don't truly know that until you realize your own God essence as pure consciousness. If a fish is born in your aquarium and you call it John, write out a birth certificate, tell him about his family history, and two minutes later he gets eaten by another fish that's tragic. But it's only tragic because you projected a separate self where there was none. You got hold of a fraction of a dynamic process, a molecular dance, and made a separate entity out of it. Consciousness takes on the disguise of forms until they reach such complexity that it completely loses itself in them. In present-day humans, Consciousness is completely identified with its disguise. It only knows itself as form and therefore lives in fear of the annihilation of its physical or psychological form. This is the egoic mind, and this is where considerable dysfunction sets in. It now looks as if something had gone very wrong somewhere along the line of evolution. But even this is part of Lila, the divine game. Finally, the pressure of suffering created by this apparent dysfunction forces consciousness to disidentify from form, and awakens it from its dream of form. It regains self-consciousness, but it is at a far deeper level than when it lost it. This process is explained by Jesus in his parable of the lost son, who leaves his father's home, squanders his wealth, becomes destitute, and is then forced by his suffering to return home. When he does, his father loves him more than before. The son's state is the same as it was before yet not the same. It has an added dimension of depth. The parable describes a journey from unconscious perfection through apparent imperfection and evil to conscious perfection. Can you now see the deeper and wider significance of becoming present as the watcher of your mind? Whenever you watch the mind, you withdraw consciousness from mind forms, which then becomes what we call the watcher or the witness. Consequently, the watcher pure consciousness beyond form becomes stronger and the mental formations become weaker. When we talk about watching the mind we are personalizing an event that is truly of cosmic significance. Through you, consciousness is awakening out of its dream of identification with form, and withdrawing from form. This foreshadows, but is already part of, an event that is probably still in the distant future, as far as chronological time is concerned. The event is called the end of the world. When consciousness frees itself from its identification with physical and mental forms, it becomes what we may call pure or enlightened consciousness, or presence. This has already happened in a few individuals, and it seems destined to happen soon on a much larger scale. Although there is no absolute guarantee that it will happen, most humans are still in the grip of the egoic mode of consciousness, identified with their mind and run by their mind. If they do not free themselves from their mind in time, they will be destroyed by it. They will experience increasing confusion, conflict, violence, illness, despair, madness. Egoic mind has become like a sinking ship. If you don't get off, you will go down with it. The collective egoic mind is the most dangerously insane and destructive entity ever to inhabit this planet. What do you think will happen on this planet if human consciousness remains unchanged? Already for most humans, the only respite they find from their own minds is to occasionally revert to a level of consciousness below thought. Everyone does that every night during sleep. But this also happens to some extent through sex, alcohol, and other drugs that suppress excessive mind activity. If it weren't for alcohol, tranquilizers, antidepressants, as well as the illegal drugs, which are all consumed in vast quantities, the insanity of the human mind would become even more glaringly obvious than it is already. I believe that, if deprived of their drugs, a large part of the population would become a danger to themselves and others. These drugs, of course, simply keep you stuck in dysfunction. Their widespread use only delays the breakdown of the old mind structures and the emergence of higher consciousness. While individual users may get some relief from the daily torture inflicted on them by their minds, they are prevented from generating enough conscious presence to rise above thought and so find true liberation. Falling back to a level of consciousness below mind, which is the pre-thinking level of our distant ancestors and of animals and plants, is not an option for us. There is no way back. If the human race is to survive, it will have to go on to the next stage. Consciousness is evolving throughout the universe in billions of forms. So even if we didn't make it, 
This wouldn't matter on a cosmic scale. No gain in consciousness is ever lost, so it would simply express itself through some other form. But the very fact that I am speaking here and you are listening or reading this is a clear sign that the new consciousness is gaining a foothold on the planet. There is nothing personal in this. I am not teaching you. You are consciousness, and you are listening to yourself. There is an Eastern saying, the teacher and the taught together create the teaching. In any case, the words in themselves are not important. They are not the truth. They only point to it. I speak from presence, and as I speak, you may be able to join me in that state. Although every word that I use has a histo language does, the words that I sp frequency of presence, quite apart. Silence is an even more potent C. Listen to me speak. Be aware of T. Be aware of the gaps. To listen T. Direct way of becoming present. Silence underneath and in Betu immediately creates stillness. Inside the silence outside. And what I freed from thought forms. Here talking about. Christ. The reality of why. Don't get attached to any one war that is more meaningful to you. See sometimes called in the East. TH is that Christ refers to your Indu conscious of it or not, whereas PR essence. Many misunderstandings and falls that there is no past or future in contradiction in terms. Jesus was a go and realized divine precinct. Chapter 6. You spoke earlier about the importance of having deep roots within or inhabiting the body. Can you explain what you meant by that? The body can become a point of access into the realm of being. Let's go into that more deeply now. I am still not quite sure if I fully understand what you mean by being. Water. What do you mean by that? I don't understand it. This is what a fish would say if it had a human mind. Please stop trying to understand being. You have already had significant glimpses of being. But the mind will always try to squeeze it into a little box, and then put a label on it. It cannot be done. It cannot become an object of knowledge. In being, subject and object merge into one. Being can be felt as the ever-present I am that is beyond name and form. To feel and thus to know that you are and to abide in that deeply rooted state is enlightenment, is the truth that Jesus says will make you free. Free from what? Free from the illusion that you are nothing more than your physical body and your mind. This illusion of the self, as the Buddha calls it, is the core error. Free from fear in its countless disguises as the inevitable consequence of that illusion. The fear that is your constant tormentor. As long as you derive your sense of self only from this ephemeral and vulnerable form. And free from sin, which is the suffering you unconsciously inflict on yourself and others. As long as this illusory sense of self governs what you think, say, and do. I don't like the word sin. It implies that I am being judged and found guilty. I can understand that. Over the centuries, many erroneous views and interpretations have accumulated around words such as sin due to ignorance, misunderstanding, or a desire to control. But they contain an essential core of truth. If you are unable to look beyond such interpretations and so cannot recognize the reality to which the word points, then don't use it. Don't get stuck on the level of words. A word is no more than a means to an end. It's an abstraction. Not unlike a signpost, it points beyond itself. The word honey isn't honey. You can study and talk about honey for as long as you like, but you won't really know it until you taste it. After you have tasted it, the word becomes less important to you. You won't be attached to it anymore. Similarly, you can talk or think about God continuously for the rest of your life. But does that mean you know or have even glimpsed the reality to which the word points? It really is no more than an obsessive attachment to a signpost, a mental idol. The reverse also applies. If, for whatever reason, you dislike the word honey, that might prevent you from ever tasting it. If you had a strong aversion to the word God, which is a negative form of attachment, you may be denying not just the word but also the reality to which it points. You would be cutting yourself off from the possibility of experiencing that reality. All this is, of course, intrinsically connected with being identified with your mind. So, if a word doesn't work for you anymore, then drop it and replace it with one that does work. If you don't like the word sin, then call it unconsciousness or insanity. That may get you closer to the truth, the reality behind the word, than a long misused word like sin and leaves little room for guilt. Of course there is something wrong with you and you are not being judged. I don't mean to offend you personally, 
But do you not belong to the human race that has killed over 2 million members of their own species in the 20th?